Uh, I'm Alvin Hoodie, part of the Brown faculty. I literally flew in from Beijing a couple days ago to be a part of today's wonderful events um, this afternoon with our poet and Brown alum, Winter Blum of Hawaii, and this evening with uh, our celebrated writer, Ha Jin. So, I don't think Ha Jin needs an introduction because I'm, unless I'm wrong, you are all here because you have read something he has written. Am I right? Yes. Clap yes. if I'm right. <laughs> In fact, I have been devouring, and I use the word devouring deliberately. I have been devouring his work, his work recently. I um, picked up 19 Requiem. Uh, hot off the press and read it in one sitting because he can hardly put it down. Uh, I was recently, a month ago, in Nanjing and was on the campus of Jingling, which is now Jingling Women's College, which is now uh, Nanjing Women's uh, Normal University or Nanjing Teachers University. And it's a beautiful, beautiful campus. Uh, and so it's really such a pleasure and a great honor to introduce our speaker this evening. Ha Jin, of course, uh, is his pen name. This is in the great tradition of China where writers don't use their real names. My father was a writer, and I think he had 12 names for the 12 books he has written. So, well, although, thank goodness, Ha Jin sticks to that one pen name. So we know of this one uh, really rich list of uh, novels and short stories and essays that they are all indeed by the same person, Ha Jin, who was born Jin Xue, Fei Xue as in snow, and Fei as in fly or flight. So maybe we can translate it as blowing snow. I, I'm trying to be poetic, Wintech. He was born in Liaoling province in uh, northern China because his father was serving in the military. And then in 1969, when he was only 14 years old, he joined the People's Liberation Army, which was based at the border of China and the former Soviet Union. Now, this next part is really amazing. He began to teach himself English. Now, you know, when you read Ha Jin, you are not reading a translation. He writes in English. And that should put all of us native English speakers in sh to shame, because uh, we don't write English the way Ha Jin writes English. He taught himself then English while in the army. And of course, he took courses in middle and high school. And then he worked as a railroad telegrapher in a remote frontier city in the Northeast. In China, the Northeast Dongbei is legendary. First of all, for being very, very cold. Secondly, for being a border region close to the former Soviet Union, but also very close to uh, Korea. And then he, um, he followed the English learner's program, uh, hoping one day, he says, so that he could read Engels, The Condition of the Working Class in England, in the English original. But then things took a dark turn in his life, uh, as happened to so many uh, young Chinese of his generation. Um, the Cultural Revolution in 1977. Uh, the Cultural Revolution, of course, closed down many universities. Universities were reopened in 1977. He passed the entrance exam, and he was assigned to study English. This is what happens to higher education in China even today. You take an exam, no gaokao, this terrifies the Chinese students 
after high school, and then based on the score, you are assigned to study a subject at a university. And um, he was assigned to study English, apparently, because he didn't do very well in his exams. So English was his last choice. He probably wanted to study engineer or medicine or something like that. Hmm? But he received a BA from Heilongjiang University uh, in Dongbei and a master's in Anglo-American literature in his home province of Shandong. Then he came to the United States to do graduate work at Brandeis University and like all good Chinese graduate students worked in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> he earned his PhD in English from Brandeis in 1993 and he intended to return to China. But then Tiananmen happened and Ha Jin and his wife decided it's probably not a good idea to return to China just yet. And they wanted to make a life for themselves here with their son, Wen. And this is how the story goes. And listen up, everybody. When he couldn't get a job, he decided he would write novels and short stories in English instead. So for all of you unemployed or underemployed people in the audience, if you don't like your job, try writing English novels and short stories. And maybe you can be the next Ha Jin. Anyway, I think it is really such an honor and a pleasure for us here at Brown to have a wonderful colleague because Ha Jin is a professor of English at Boston University, just down the road from us. And I won't read the long list of his works because you all have them. And after his reading today, um, he will first talk to us a bit. And then he will read a short selection from his newest work, Nanjian Requiem, after which we can take some questions, have some discussion, and then his books are for sale outside. And I think he will be delighted to sign uh, his books for you. So before I, um, I yield the floor to Ha Jin, let me just make some quick announcements. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. from 10 to 1, uh, Professor Forrest Gander of Literary Arts will moderate a fantastic panel with our two writers, um, Wing Tech Lum and Ha Jin, and two of our professors, uh, our own Carrie Smith of History and East Asian Studies, and Geo Saito from Tokyo, uh, who has uh, written uh, on Asian American literature and has, as I understand, engaged in a ongoing conversation with Wing Tech Lam. Uh, they, will, uh, they will engage each other and uh, the audience tomorrow, and you are all invited from 10 to as long as 1 p.m. on this intriguing topic, cultural production, collective co catastrophe, memory, and history. Let me say that again. Cultural production, collective catastrophe, memory, and history. And then Friday, this Friday, our president, Ruth Simmons, will moderate a panel discussion on the topic of trends on globalization, perspectives from Asian universities with several guests from Asian universities. That discussion will be held at noon in the computer science conference room on the fourth floor. You are all invited to both events. And finally, I think we should also acknowledge the role of a wonderful person who put these events together around our two um, uh, creative artists. And uh, let's really give a hand to Zhang and Wong. Where's John? John and Wong.
Uh, John is a visiting scholar at the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. And uh, I know he has been working on this for months. And it's just wonderful, John, that everything has come together so well. So now let's welcome Ha Jin to the podium. Ha Jin, here is water. Okay, I'll give you a hand. Okay, now I want to open this for you so you, you don't forget to take a drink every now and then. Because, oh my goodness, this is a defective bottle, you see? <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Thank, okay. You, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, uh, to be, I guess, um, among the f first, one of the first users of this f <laughs> venue, uh, this brand new venue. And uh, I, I'm going to talk uh, 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 a little about uh, the uh, problems and difficulties in, uh, in writing this book. Uh, they are also related to some bigger issues, but I think that's uh, it's important for me to to talk to share the experience with you, and then I will read some pages uh, uh, from this book, uh, and then I hope you will have questions, uh, so we can have some conversation. Um, I think many of you uh, 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 must have known of this tragedy, the rape of Nanjing, uh, for a long time. But when I grew up, I only vaguely heard of it. I didn't know anything in detail about this event. It was just a, a, a for people of my generation, it was just just a hearsay. And <clears throat> but when after I, I had come to the States, uh, I was surprised to see uh, some that some Asian Americans uh, would hold gatherings meetings every year uh, in memory of this uh, event. And at those gatherings, very often there were exhibits of graphics and other materials. So it was a shocker to me. And so as a result, I began to follow this, uh, try to read and follow uh, 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 things published about this event. And then in the year 1997, and Irish Chan's book, uh, uh, The Rape of Nanjing, uh, came out. And so I read that book, and that really opened a lot of things uh, to me. Especially among the, all the new information, there, I was surprised to, to know that uh, there were foreigners' involvement in this uh, event. That was, in fact, in, in Chinese media, it had been suppressed for decades. Uh, and foreigners were portrayed, especially Westerners, were portrayed as collaborators with the Japanese. So that really was just, the, the story was just the opposite. So that, for me, that was a big surprise. And so around that time, I began to think about how to make, to write about this, how to present this historical moment in literature. This was in the early, I think around 2002 or three, But I just played with this idea for a long time. I couldn't find it at the right angle. But then later, uh, I began to think about the meaning of uh, as a possibility, as a point of uh, entry. Because this event was so big, it, it would be always uh, better or productive to approach it through an individual's uh, uh, experience uh, and then through that experience and to make this uh, story uh, more suggestive uh, expansive so that was my plan and by then I had read I began to read uh, uh, things published on uh, mini margin there were two biographies uh, one was published earlier in the 50s uh, another was quite recent in the 90s uh, in, in the er, I think no, not 90s, around about 10 years ago. So I began to, uh, uh, to gather information uh, on her. I think there was another reason why I, I decided on her as my point of entry uh, to this event, because she was a, a, 
a obscure figure to the Chinese and also to the Americans. And but historically in China, uh, all the Americans, their involvement was suppressed. So I really want to uh, present this as uh, a really a, a, as a kind of more objectively uh, as a kind of a, uh, reinterpretation uh, or presentation of this moment. And there are other th uh, concerns. Because of these foreigners' involvement, I realized this was not a ju just the Chinese experience, it was also part of uh, American experience. Uh, in addition to many abortion, there were, there were a number of um, American missionaries, um, Sir Bates, uh, Louis uh, Smith, Robert Wilson, uh, John Magee, who became a minister at Yale later on. So all these, uh, the, they were heroes, and they were really, they were part of the experience of the Nanjing Massacre. Uh, I, I think it was fair to say without them, that story was not complete. What happened was at the moment when the Japanese army was poised to attack uh, the city, to take the city. And the group of foreigners, uh, uh, basically Americans and the Germans, they decided, uh, two German, uh, two or three German businessmen. And uh, one of them was the well-known figure, John Robert, uh, who ironically, who was the local leader, the Nazi leader of the, that city. Uh, and who happened to, to know Hitler personally, even. Um, but he was really he was the leader of this effort uh, to uh, protect the Chinese civilians from the, uh, uh, the evading forces. And <coughs> but these people, they set up a, a zone called the uh, International Safety Zone to protect non-military uh, 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 members, basically civilians, the refugees. So once the attack started, uh, a lot of people flooded into this zone. Uh, at the peak, it was about a quarter of a million people, Chinese civilians, were sheltered uh, in this area. And so these foreigners, uh, most of them were American, uh, American missionaries, they had to try to figure out how to help these people because they have to feed them. See, the Chinese could not drive uh, because the Japanese soldiers would confiscate their vehicles. So as a result, only foreigners could drive to transport rations and fuel. So that's why these foreigners, they work day and night. And for uh, several weeks, uh, they were uh, the drivers of these car trucks. And also, other a lot of other jobs they had to organize how to maintain uh, uh, sanitation and uh, other a lot of other concerns, and I think more importantly later on, um, at the Tokyo trial a few years later, and uh, the, the Chinese went there without with very little evidence uh, because uh, when the Chinese were fighting the Japanese, they had never collected made an effort to collect the evidence, and unable to imagine that someday they would sit on the tribunal as victors uh, to try these uh, generals. So the Chinese didn't do anything uh, to uh, preserve evidence. As a result, the, the, the committee, the judges, depended on the evidence collected by the American missionaries, such as photographs and medical records, uh, uh, journals, uh, every one of the American missionary somehow kept a journal. And uh, there were also uh, eight films, f footage of, of, of the, uh, uh, the atrocity uh, shot by uh, John Magee. And so you see that part, because of these evidence collected by these foreigners, the, the judges could decide uh, to, could evaluate uh, the scale, the magnitude of the tragedy. And uh, so really that, without that part, without this uh, uh, involvement, uh, the effort made by these foreigners, somehow um, uh, this case, uh, this tragedy 
uh, might still have been a different kind of uh, uh, event. Uh, we know that there has been a, a group in, in Japan that's, that is called a fictional group. That means the, the whole event, the tragedy was fabricated. Uh, so I think, but that's important for us to remember the evidence against that kind of interpretation were mainly was mainly collected by uh, Americans, and so that was the situation. That's why I want to write put the Chinese story in the context of the international uh, involvement. Uh, so this part uh, is not just Chinese experience; it's much bigger beyond that. That was my, uh, in fact, rational decision and to. Uh, use mini watching as an entry. But there are other, a lot of concerns. The immediate, as a fiction writer, the, I think I, I approach this with a lot of complicated feelings. On the one hand, because English was not my first language, it was a, a fiction writer, when we come to a, a historical novel, the first thing usually comes to our mind would be and try to give a voice to that person. <laughs> so that also means, uh, uh, ideally speaking, Minnie Watching should be the speaker of this novel. But that really was beyond my ability, because she lived 70, 70, more than 70 years ago, and she had a very a strong religious, religious background. She's from a, a small town, farm town in, Milan, uh, in Illinois. So all her background somehow uh, would be very hard for me to grasp, to present her in her own voice convincingly. That was beyond my, uh, my ability. Uh, and, but I, basically, I just follow the conventional approach. And then I thought, uh, I, 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 I thought maybe I could write four novellas. She would appear in each of them. Then the four novellas came together. It would become a novel. Uh, so that was my <laughs> initial uh, 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 thought. Uh, but there was a lot of hubris in this decision because I thought I had published five, uh, eight books of fiction, so I knew the craft. So this shouldn't be a problem as long as I make each story uh, novella, well, uh, as a piece of fiction, they should be able to hang together. That was my initial uh, 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 rationale for this uh, project. So when, uh, in 2008, I began to, to write, uh, work very hard, and that fall I took a, a sabbatical, so I went to Berlin. <laughs> uh, stayed in, in the city uh, alone, uh, uh, working on this uh, uh, manuscript. Uh, I stayed there for four months. And somehow when I came back, I showed the manuscript to my wife and my son, and they read, they told me it didn't work. <laughs> and uh, so I really gave up and uh, for a while. Then I felt I, I shouldn't give up. For two weeks later, I thought, I, I couldn't afford to waste my, <laughs> my life this way, uh, so <laughs> I had to return to it. So I, I picked it up again. So in fact, twice it was repeated. I gave it up and then returned to it. Um, after many, many divisions, I think uh, at 32, uh, after 32 revisions, I sent the manuscript to my editor. And he, I, in fact, he said a similar thing. Uh, the project is important. The book, is, they're very excited about this uh, uh, book, but somehow the, the book didn't gel. In fact, I expected that uh, uh, response. The book just didn't hang together. There was something wrong in it. So that uh, afterward, uh, I took it back. I told my editor, and that I give me two more years, uh, maybe I should uh, be able to try to figure out a way to rewrite this book. And then I decided to, to invent a narrator. Uh, in other words, to tell me the story uh, by a Chinese woman uh, who would work for her uh, as her assist assistant. Then the Chinese woman would have her own story 
her own family's involvement with this tragedy. What happened here was, if, I think that's the problem. Nowadays, I always ask my students when they write a historical novel, novel I would say, is there a biography written on this person? So the, 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 rash, the reason for that is once a historical figure is already described in nonfiction, it would be very hard for the fiction writer to invent events for that person. Uh, in the case of Minnie Waltrin, the first six weeks during the massacre, it was less difficult to write because, because uh, uh, the, the drama was very intense. There, was a, there were so many things going on. So it was uh, one thing after another, very rapid. Uh, there were a lot of uh, written materials already, so everything was available for a fiction writer uh, to work on. But afterward, she stayed another two and a half years in China. But during that period, nothing dramatic really happened to, to her personal life. There was no major event. So as a result, after the first part, after the, after the massacre, six weeks, then the other part, the rest of the book, would have no energy, no narrative drive. So it would be very hard to sustain the narration. I think that was the source of the trouble. And in fact, before my book, there had been a novel written on her, uh, based on her life. The author, I think he was British, he encountered a similar, pro a similar problem, uh, but he came up with a different solution. So he invented a love affair for her, for Minnie Walton, and made her fall in love with a married Chinese man who could not reciprocate the love. So that, as a result, she was desperate, and eventually she had a breakdown. And so I think that uh, you, in this case, the romance was used as the source, the engine at the engine for the narr narration. Uh, but again, as I s said just now, there had been two biographies on this woman. She was a real person. She was, uh, she was a, 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 a real Christian, uh, very clean. Uh, she had a very per simple, a clean life. It's very hard for, uh, it would be irresponsible for me to give anything that to her that didn't happen to her. And uh, I think beyond that, there was a huge historical event, a very solemn, serious uh, tragedy. And I couldn't, I just couldn't do that. And it would be kind of uh, frivolous, I think, if I re really invent things like that for her. And that's, I think that was the source, uh, the, the source of the trouble. That's why I think by inventing a, a woman uh, assistant for her uh, as a narrator, uh, that will uh, uh, help uh, tremendously. In fact, this morning at lunch, uh, Wintech asked me, you know, whether uh, is this woman uh, uh, based upon Cheng uh, Ruifang, right? Uh, there was, historically, there was an assistant who worked for Mini, for Mini Walton. But it wasn't, I, at the time, I knew Cheng Ruifang left a diary. This Chinese woman also uh, wrote a diary. But I ha would have to invent a figure because uh, I need the woman to have a more complicated back family background so that uh, that, that family's ex ex appearance would be more uh, uh, exemplar of the, the Chinese victims, the, the side of the Chinese uh, civilians because they were the real victims. Uh, so in other words, ethically, the book need to kind of balance. Like on, the, on the one hand, I have an American woman's story. On the other hand, there must be some uh, uh, presentation of the real victim's experience. So as a result, I need, I need a, 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 a fictional character for that. So that's why I really didn't work hard on her diary. I just have to uh, stop there because research can be endless. That's another, another uh, 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 trap in writing historical fiction. Uh, at some point, we should be clear about what you need. So at, at that point, I just stop doing research uh, uh, on her. But I came because I need her family uh, uh, to have a, a different kind of um, members. For instance, the husband, 
her husband uh, would have a Japanese background, who had earned a degree, a master's from a Japanese university. As a result, the man had a lot of affection for Japanese life and experience. And he loved Japanese things, but he was torn. Uh, and later he was uh, uh, urged by uh, his former uh, schoolmates in Japan to join the puppet government. And the, the man had to escape to avoid being involved in uh, the puppet uh, administration. And that their son, uh, and in the son, he was uh, supposed to study uh, medicine in Japan. And later he married a Japanese woman. And then he was forced to return to China. And so by doing this, uh, in fact, uh, the scope of the book will be widened. In other words, it will involve the Japanese side as well. Let's face it, in fact, the, the, historically, a lot of Japanese civilians were also victims. So toward the end, basically, uh, the, the young boy would have no father, and the young Japanese woman became a widow. I think this, the book really needed that kind of uh, entanglement between the two nations, and also, I think, a, a, a kind of a broader scope uh, to include everybody uh, as kind of victims uh, of this tragedy. So I think that, that was, uh, I think it was the right decision. Once I started uh, along this line, and everything came together rapidly. Uh, in four months, uh, I finished uh, the manuscript. And that was a lesson. Uh, that also, that the lesson is all the mistakes and wrong turns had to be homework. They were necessary. Uh, uh, all the missteps, in fact, uh, uh, would lead me towards the right approach. And uh, there is another dimension uh, of this lesson. That was the original assumption that many watchers need a voice. I think that was mistaken because she left a diary, very uh, bulky uh, diary, uh, more than 500 pages long, single space. Uh, it is available online. It's really in the uh, public domain. So the voice is there, genuine and uh, very, uh, very authentic. She really doesn't need a voice. She, what she needed was a, 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 long, a story about her, a long piece of narrative. Uh, so I think that's, a, I think the final design, uh, uh, the structure of the book was, I think it was the only way, to me, it was the only way to tell her story. Uh, about research, historical research, I think there are, you, you might have noticed if you read the book, there, um, some of the characters I use actual names, especially those for those men uh, uh, and the missionaries. Uh, uh, I couldn't say anything bad about them because they were real heroes and they did so much for the victims. Uh, and so I wouldn't hesitate to just use their names. There, there will be difficulties, because once I uh, present them as a real figure, I have to figure out what kind of, uh, uh, how high they are, you know, <laughs> what kind of physical features they have. Some of them, I can see their faces, but uh, are they big men? Are they smaller frame, small framed person? So uh, there are a lot of other things, but I have, in that case, I have to be very careful to observe a lot of photographs to make a judgment and to make, because these are real people. But there are other kind of people. Uh, there are people who really, uh, who, and who will be needed uh, as characters, as foes, uh, or as kind of contrast to meaning. So in the case of those characters, I would just uh, stop doing research because I knew intuitively, as a fiction writer, intuitively, I knew I would have to create a character there. So I would avoid using real name. So I, in other words, I have to create a story for those characters and use a fictionalized name for each of them. That will save, uh, in fact, that will serve the book well, much better. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, it would avoid a lot of a lot, uh, uh, wrong approaches. As I said, historically, if, if we do research for a historical novel, it can be endless. It's better to have some kind of design uh, um, at the very beginning so that uh, uh, we, can, uh, it, we can have a good sense of uh, the actual needs of the book. Uh, so that was my... Uh, 
uh, approach uh, and and the mis uh, missteps I made. Uh, I, I'll talk more about this if you have questions about uh, uh, any of these uh, uh, any aspects of the novel. And I'm going to do, read a, 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 a scene here. This is a pivotal scene, and this uh, toward the end of the uh, you know uh, not um, the end, but. The, the massacre, in fact, took place on uh, December 12th, 1937. And, but the first two weeks was, very, was really very, very uh, 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 violent, extremely violent. Uh, before Christmas, uh, uh, the whole city was burned. And, and <clears throat> so there were a lot of uh, killing, uh, murder, and rape, and arson going on. But this was uh, toward, is toward the end of that uh, uh, initial two weeks. Uh, this happened on December 24th. Uh, for the novel, this was a pivotal point, because on this day, Minnie made a mistake. And she made a mistake, uh, of course, under duress. And she mentioned this in her diary. But, but uh, in the following week, uh, when she wrote to the trustees, uh, board members uh, in New York, she did not mention her mistake. Uh, uh, but, but if we read the lines or uh, the diary, different pieces, uh, uh, we c we could find that she took to her bed right after this event. She was sick, very sick, uh, uh, for some days. Apparently, my interpretation was she was she was troubled. She was tormented by this uh, uh, mistake, and and this. Uh, so as a result, she was haunted by it. Uh, so this was related to her uh, breakdown later on. That was my interpretation. I do believe it has very solid uh, grounds. Uh, um, <clears throat> okay, this is the moment. Uh, okay, let me try to start here. Uh, Uh, on December 24th, we went to the main office to make plans for Christmas. As we were talking, and many was jotting down our ideas on a notepad, a group of Japanese soldiers headed by a colonel appeared. She led them into the office and asked a servant to serve tea. A scrawny teenage boy, 